uh, we're treating the candidates and the members of the audience with respect and civility. We are using timers so that the candidates each have a fair and equitable time to answer the questions. We don't have any applause or um, yays or any of those things during the conversation. You can save all of your energy for that till the end when we thank the candidates. The, the reason that we do that is that we want the most time to be expended by the candidates telling you what their ideas are. We don't want to waste the time because we just have an hour uh, with any other disruption. All questions are submitted in writing and uh, Barbara, one of our league members, is sorting them for me so that we put them in some sort of an order. We will do as many questions as we possibly can. Uh, the candidates will have one minute to give an opening statement. The order was determined by a flip of the coin and Chris won the flip of the coin and he designated Kate to go first. So she will give the first opening statement which will be a one minute statement or less if she wishes. And then Chris will give an opening statement and then we will just keep changing from one to the other as the questions go through. Um, the timing for this is 60 seconds for the first respondent, followed by 90 seconds for the second respondent, followed by 30 seconds for the first respondent. So. The first respondent has a chance to speak, and if the first respondent has some response they like to give the other person or something else to add on, they have another 30 seconds. So each of them has 90 seconds. We have two timers, Pauline and Joanne are up front, and each of them will be working with one candidate. Um, also, I have to say, I, I'm about as loud as I can get. <laughs> now there is no microphone. Um, I have to tell you that all of the people who are working on this are not residents of this district. I live in Gales Ferry, which is part of Ledyard. Pauline lives in New London. Joanne lives in East Lyme, or Niantic, East Lyme. Uh, Irene lives in the Groton side of Mystic, and Barbara lives in New London. So uh, we hope that we are as fair and just as we possibly can be. At the end, we'll have a two-minute closing from each of the candidates, and uh, let's get started. So I'll turn first to Kate for your opening statement. And remember, her microphone is only for the TV. Okay, so we're going to try to make it work this way. I hope you can all hear me. Um, I, I, I have a loud voice, so I think you probably can hear me. Um, good evening, I'm Kate Rotella, and thank you all for attending this community conversation to talk about the issues that are important to Stonington, North Stonington, and our state of Connecticut. Um, I want to thank the Women's League for League Women. the League of Women Voters, I'm sorry, um, and the North Stonington DTC for coordinating this event. Um, I am running for the state representative of the 43rd District because I'm committed to serving our community. Um, I want to serve this community. It's my home. My professional education and my background make me uniquely qualified to get this position. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in economics and finance. I have a master's degree in public administration. I've worked in government for over 10 years um, doing sourcing, strategic sourcing, procurement, contract negotiations, municipal budgeting, and um, other planning things within the town. Thank you, Kate. One minute is expired. Wow, that was quick. It does happen quickly. And so we'll turn to Chris. Chris, you see your timer out there? Yep, right, right there. Chris, please, your opening statement. <laughs> so my name is uh, Chris Donahue, and I'd like to thank the League of Women's Voters and the North Stonington DTC for putting this on tonight. I've been cut from the cloth of public service. Unfortunately, I lost my father at 18 and became the co-head of our household. Uh, putting off my education so I could help out my three siblings to ensure their quality of life. During that time, I joined another family known as the Pawtuck Fire Department. I learned to work together as teams to fight to get the job done 
in crisis situations, no matter what. I believe I can bring these same guts to Hartford that's needed to make these hard decisions. I intend to fight for our fair share of VCS funding to make it affordable for seniors to live around here and to close the skill gap. I believe I can bring a fresh perspective and I will be a full-time legislator. I'm deeply committed and I love this community 100%. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well done. Our first question, which is probably not surprising to anybody in this room. Connecticut's budget is out of control. What will you do to lessen the tax burden for Connecticut residents? And I would turn that over to Chris. The, the tax burden is out of control. Uh, the budget is hurting right now. But there are solutions. What we need to do is we need to rein in spending in certain parts. And we also need to get revenue. We need to grow jobs. We need to fill the skill gaps. What I will do is introduce legislation that will incentivize small businesses to train apprentices of the future for the skills that is necessary uh, to, to bring us forward in Connecticut. I believe that by doing this, it will grow the economy, put more money back into the economy, and we will have a better quality of life. Um, we have to restrain our spending in certain ways. Uh, for example, we just hired 30 new judges in Connecticut that don't have the staffs to support them. I mean, spending's okay, but we need to do it in the right place and we need to take the time to make the right decisions. That is all. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Kate, the same question. 30 seconds. I have 30 seconds, correct? No, you have 90 seconds. Okay. Okay, so um, the budget in the state of Connecticut is certainly um, out of control, and we have to work hard to talk about what we're going to spend our funds on. How much government do we want? What programs are important to us? What programs can we wait on? We need to look at our, our, at our pension funding, how we funded it, how are we going to continue to fund it. We need to look at small businesses. We need to make departments that work for the state and people who get loans and grants from the state for small businesses accountable. There are different programs that we can go about doing this by. There's results-based accountability. There are report cards that come in to the state legislator and the state senators um, that will help us maintain those items. Um, certainly, we, have to, we need to grow business in the state of Connecticut. Um, and growing that will increase our tax revenue. Um, so but we need to make sure that people are accountable for what we give them. And Chris, you have another 30 seconds to yeah. add. Yeah, and as, so as, as far as um, funding our pension funds, we need to honor the contracts that were promised. And after the CBAC agreement okay. runs out, we need to go back to the table and negotiate with collective bargaining and the legislator to get something that's proper, proper and sustainable for the state of Connecticut going forward. I believe this will be, have a huge impact on my future and your family's future here in Stonington and North Stonington. Thank you very much. Very good. Uh, Kate, your, your question is, what are, the, what are your ideas to improve public transportation and reduce traffic accidents on 95? And please get that magic going now. <laughs> so um, I believe there are a lot of things that we need to do here in the state of Connecticut on transportation. We will need to be looking at tolls and how we get tolls into the state safely. We had tolls before. We had a, a very serious accident. We took tolls out. The states around us do have tolls, and they are doing it effectively. Um, tolls now can be electronic, and the money that we receive from the tolls should go into a lockbox. That is what I would fight for, for it to be in a lockbox. And that money then would be used for infrastructure on our roads um, and infrastructure in other ways. We need to look at rails. We need to look at how we can grow our rail system here and, and our bus system here. That's, those are important modes of transportation, especially getting into the cities and getting across the, the state of Connecticut. So what I would say is I would like to extend Shoreline East uh, that stops in New London. I'd like to extend it to Stonington and the Westerly as well. I think that will get more people my age moving here that work in the big cities if they have more affordable transportation to get up to the big cities. As far as tolls go, I think they can be a good idea, but I want to make sure that it's not going to be put on the backs of the contractors that are going into Rhode Island every day. 
I uh, also, as far as tolls go, I would approve them as long as they don't make Route 2 and Route 1 I-95 and they don't turn it into a parking lot. So I'd have to see how it's laid out before I agreed to it. And I would like to see and be guaranteed that it's going to be in a lockbox transportation fund and it will not be put in the general fund to be wasted. And uh, that's my idea on public transportation. Thank you very much. Okay. You have 30 seconds if you want to add anything. No. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Bar, Barbara, you can send some more questions up to me, please. Yes. Okay. All right. We still have, we have two more before we run out. All right. So this next question is Chris's. What do you think the state's role in the environmental protection should be given the current EPA's interest in loosening the regulations? I think we need to put our own environmental protection laws into place that protect us. Uh, it's, a, it's a right move because climate change is a very real thing. Um, I see that we got alternative sources of energy coming to the state right now, like in New London with the wind farms. I think that could be incredible for us. But we also have to get the fishing fleet to the table when we discuss what we're going to do with that. Because, yes, it can create jobs, but we don't want to hurt the fishing fleet at the same time. But I don't want to see these two, two parties come into conflict because I think they're both very important for the economy. Um, I think the wind farms can create tons of jobs and it will take us into the future as far as alternative energy. And I think uh, that the fishing fleet has to be protected. So I'd like to get them both at the table. And that would be some of my ideas. And I'd like to see... Uh, the state put their own EPA laws and regulation to protect against what's been taken down in Washington, D.C. Okay. Yeah. So um, when it comes to environmental protection, um, here in Stonington and in North Stonington, those are really big issues for us here. You have, we have our coastal community. We have our farmlands here. Um, you know, I would like to see conservation efforts move forward. We've worked very hard, I know in Stonington, um, on the Pawcatuck River Woodshed um, project. We've worked on our Conservation Commission and different, um, different efforts towards um, making our environment a better place to be in. Um, as far as um, the, I think it's a great idea, I, I agree with Chris, um, getting the fishermen and the, the windmills um, community into the same room to talk about how we can do it. Can we harness that energy? Um, how can we do it without affecting our fishing community? That's really important, um, especially for Stonington. Absolutely. It's very, very important. Um, we have a lot of solar energy um, that is moving forward. And um, of course, you know, there are some incentives for different energy in home. And I think we have to encourage those sorts of things. Different incentives for geothermal, different incentives for putting solar on our homes. Um, reward people for those things. Thank you. Chris, yeah. do you have anything more you want to add? I just want to add to what we were saying about, you know, bringing people together. That's the common interest here in Connecticut. A lot of people have great ideas on what they want to see done in this state. And they just and they come to a point where they oppose each other. I think if we could get each other into the same room and search for win-win solutions, we could really take this state forward. And I really believe that. I love this community, and I want to see it flourish. Thank you. Very good. Um, for those who just came in, if you have questions you want to ask, there are cards on the table back there. Uh, we only take questions on the cards. Thanks. So now we are. Back to Kate. It's a good thing I'm keeping a chart here. So I'll keep us all to task. Uh, Kate, what will you do to encourage small business to come to North Stonington? To North Stonington? To North okay. Um, so I think that small business is one of um, the things that was in North Stonington's plan of economic development. I think it's very important for North Stonington to have small businesses come. They're a great community. Um, and they have a lot to offer for their community. I think that they have, um, they have, they're moving forward with new schools, which is going to make people, m more people move into their community. And that school project, I think, will be encouragement for small businesses to open up here. I agree with Kate on that. And I, also what I want to do is incentivize restaurants 
who use farm to table, kind of like the engine does in Mystic, you know, uh, localized farms prospering from the new businesses that are moving in. I'd like to see farm to table and seat to table initiatives for small businesses coming in. Um, I, I'd also like to incentivize small businesses for training and uh, hiring people to fill the skill gaps in Connecticut, like I said before. I think this will be uh, huge for our area because small businesses are the backbone of the 43rd district. I, I've worked in several and I've seen how they op Oh, absolutely. I've worked in several, and I, and, and I see how the engine room does in Mystic, and it draws people in, and they're using local farms. There's a lot of rural area in North Stonington. I believe we can both benefit, both small businesses coming in and these farms. And also, what I want to do is eliminate the nine-liter law, which uh, stopped Trillium. Uh, maybe they're coming in now, but it, it stalled them from starting their project. I think microbreweries are going to be huge. Instead of people going on wine tours these days, they're going on microbrewery tours. I think they're the future. I think we need to invest in that. That's what I would do if brought into the state legislator. Thank you. Thank you. Try that. So, Kate, it's your turn to respond if you have anything you want to add to the North Stonington business. No, I, I think that um, farm to table incentives are, are absolutely great. I think that's wonderful. Um, I think you talk about green incentives also for um, the, re the businesses, whether it's a restaurant or small business that um, goes, goes all green in their business. Um, we just passed on, or we're working on something in Stonington with the plastic straws and plastic bags, and we're going to call the businesses that fall into that green star businesses, and we're going to advertise for them in our quarterly um, Stonington events magazine. So I think that different incentives like that can take place. Very good, very good. The next question will go to Chris. The question is, there is an effort to build a third casino in Connecticut. What is your view on this? Should or will you support this? So talk about the third casino. Well, first off, Mohegan Sun and Foxwoods are a big revenue driver and a big drive, job driver for this area. I want to make sure they're respected and brought to the table before any discussions like that are made and make sure there's a compact that they can be the only ones to do casino business in this state. So they'd need to be at the table when we were discussing that. Also, I don't think I, I'd have to see everything laid out because I wouldn't be in favor of taking jobs away from the 43rd district. Um, I, I think what I want to do when I get up there is fight for the slot revenue to start coming back to us here, all the host towns, because I feel like it's all going to Fairfield County right now and that's just not right. I think we're affected hugely by this, by the casinos and and there are, there are brothers, there are friends, and, and I think we need to bring the slot revenue back to the 43rd District. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Kate. Um, thank you. Uh, I agree. I have to say that I'm not in favor of another casino opening up in our state. I think Mohegan Sun and um, the Mashantucket Foxwoods Casino, um, there was a deal made where they were the only two operating casinos in the state. Um, they have given us a lot of revenue to our state. I don't think that the revenue that we get from them is, is um, dispersed fairly. I do think we need more of it down here. We bear the burden of that traffic. Um, so I believe that, as Chris said, Fairfield County and other counties are getting a lot more than we are, and I don't think that that's fair. I will fight to bring that revenue back here. Um, so. And Chris, do you have anything? No, I 100% I agree with that, and I just want to say I have a lot of friends and family that work at Foxwoods and Mohegan Sun, and I'm thankful that these casinos are here every day to create jobs. And I think they definitely need to be respected and brought to the table before any talk to, about violating the compact. I, I would not be in favor of a third casino. Thank you very much. I also want to commend the audience. Uh, there's a great variety of questions. We have many more coming, but it seems that we're touching all the hot spots, so that's very um, democracy. <laughs> democracy, that's yeah. what it's all about. So, I think it's uh, Kate's turn to start. And so, Kate, what are your thoughts and plan for action when it comes to the fight against opiates? So, that is a major, major issue um, for us, for our community, um, for our state. 
um, my thoughts are we have to look at everything. We have to look at the social aspects of it, right? So we need to fund our first responders so that they have training and the, and the Narcan and the other stuff that they need to respond to, o to an opioid overdose. But it's not just about funding that. It's about funding the social aspect of it. How are we helping people who are addicted to painkillers, opioids, or any drug? How are we helping them? What is our social service policy on that? Are we just bringing them in and turning them out? We need to look at treatment programs. We have closed our inpatient facilities um, and we need to open them back up. This is a serious problem. People need to have a place to go to rehab and we need to support them. We also need to look at when they do go through, oh, sorry. Yeah. You get another 30 seconds. Yeah. Sorry. I agree with Kate. The opioid epidemic has been a, it has been a scourge on this community, on families I know, on people I grew up with. Um, it's, been, it's been very tough to deal with. Uh, I'm a first responder. I've seen some of this stuff firsthand. Um, I've been talking to doctors in the area since I've been campaigning, and they've had ideas of extended rehab with maybe segues into right. job training. Give them something to go back to, because that's what I'm noticing a lot with the people that I've known that had opioid problems, is it was apathy. They, had, they felt like they had nowhere to go, so they self-medicated, and it, it went into a spiral effect. I believe we've got to help these people. We have to extend the rehab, segue into job training. We have to make sure that our first responders have all the funding they need and the Narcan they need to take care of this problem. We have to be there. It has to be a whole community effort, not just a legislative effort. We all need to come together. I've seen countless times of friends losing everything they have, and I've seen mothers bury their sons. It's just terrible, and I, and I don't want to see it anymore. And if I'm sent up to Hartford, I'll tell you what, that's going to be one of my top priorities is fighting the opioid epidemic. Thank you. Um, just to um, finish off what I was going to, my, my thoughts is, I absolutely believe part of the rehab effort has to be building jobs into them and giving people hope and taking away any bad feelings they have. No one wakes up and says they want to be addicted to drugs or alcohol. No one does. Um, it happens and we need to be there as a community to support people. And we need to support our first responders who are responding to this. Thank you very much. All right, then. This one goes to Chris. And what community involvement have you had prior to running for state representative, Chris? So I've been a Pawkatuck firefighter for the last 10 years. I've uh, earned num numerous certificates from there as a first responder, EMR, hazmat training, uh, certified uh, for extrication, all sorts of different stuff, and just learning to work together in teams, taking calls at 2 in the morning to put our lives on the line to better this community and to save lives. I've also worked for the Cove Center of Grieving Children because, as I said, I lost my father at a young age, and I know what kind of hole that can leave for a child. I worked with them. I was a mentor for those programs, and it was really rewarding. It was therapeutic for me, too, being able to help these kids and tell them the stories that I went through. And it made, it, it, we both connected together and we both grew together and it was very fortunate. Thank you. And Kate, what have you been involved in in the community? Um, so um, I have served as Stonington's um, second select woman for the last three years. Um, in addition to that, I uh, volunteered for the Lawrence and Memorial Hospital Auxiliary Board. I served on their board as the treasurer and finance chair. In addition to that, um, I've served on St. Michael's um, Cornerstone Committee planning and their planning committee. I've served on the St. Michael's School Board. Um, so, nice new group. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Chris, did you have anything you wanted to add? I just wanted to add a little bit more about the fire service. Uh, it taught me a lot of great lessons in life, and I think uh, any 18-year-old kid that wants to get involved should because uh, it learned, it taught me how to work together in teams despite differences, you know, to get a job done. It was a great education. I'm still involved with it today, and uh, I, I wouldn't give it up for the world. Thank you very much. All right, here's one that seems to be very um, near and dear to this community's heart. 
Do you think Connecticut should allow communities to enact their own hotel tax? And I think that's, okay, so I repeat it again, sorry. Do you think that the Connecticut should allow communities to enact their own hotel tax? And I believe that it is Kate's first turn. It is, it is my turn. So um, tourism here in this community, you know, is very, very big. We depend heavily on tourism. I think that that issue is something that we have to explore. We have to, we have to think about how that will impact um, what's going to happen with our, the dollars that we are getting from the state. Is the state, and it's going to depend also um, on who is in the governor's office, if, if, for whoever one of us, whichever one of us is up there. That will make a huge difference as to whether that can be done. I think that it's an issue that needs to be explored, needs to be looked at, and needs to be weighed out on both sides. The impact it will have on the state revenue we get and what, how, do our, how do the hotels feel about that? If we do enact it, where, what is the tax used for? Will be an important thing also to think about. I agree with that as well. Um, you know, tax sometimes sounds like a dirty word, but the way I see it uh, with hotel tax, a lot of our hotel tax goes to the state and then just like slot revenue, who knows where. I think by giving communities, empowering them to um, take up their own hotel tax, that gives them their own discretion of where to put the money, where the holes are in the municipalities that need to be filled, and they can spend the money as they like. So depends how it's laid out, again, because I'd have to look at it and research it, but right now I'd say yes. I'd say I would let municipalities put their own hotel tax as long as it was going right back into the community and it was a way to fund the municipality. Just all, just keep the questions coming in. Uh, Barbara's got quite a pile back there. Okay, then I think this is Chris's question. And Chris, what ways do you think that Stonington and North Stonington can work together for the betterment and sustainability of the towns? I think uh, there's there's a number of different ways we could work together. Uh, for the betterment and uh, sustainability of the towns. Um, I think municipalities should get together and talk, uh, the, the leaders from both towns, and uh, you know, I could set up meetings and we could talk on all things that we could do you know, for the betterment of both of our communities because I feel that if one community thrives, the next thrives too. I feel North Stonington does well, so does Stonington. And I think if we all get together at the table, uh, the first selectman from Stonington, Mr. Simmons, the first selectman from, uh, from North Stone to Mr. Ergo, and, and all the selectmen actually, we get together and we just discuss stuff that we can work together on as a community to move us forward. And that's what I would do as a state legislator with my constituency service. Thank you. So um, I think as far as Stonington and North Stonington working together, I think it's a wonderful idea. I also think that this is very um, similar to what we are doing across the state we're regionalizing different efforts. And regionalizing efforts takes thought and communication. Um, and it will be a process and everybody will have to come together and talk about it. But I think there are certainly some services that we can talk about regionalizing or working together to make better for our towns so that we can spend our tax dollars more effectively, allowing us to do more programs across our towns, um, and um, so, and also, I also think that um, when you regionalize the two, the two towns together, if they regionalize, we'll, we work together. We work together anyway. Our communities come together all the time. I think it's important. We have a lot of the same concerns when it comes to conservation and other efforts. So. Chris, do you have anything you want to add? Yeah, I would. Uh, so. Um, my whole life I've been playing sports with uh, people from North Stonington. Um, I, f I feel a kinship to them. And what Kate was saying about regionalization could be a great thing. You know, as long as we could all get together and agree on the terms, I think we could save money that way. And, and I respect that. Yeah. All right. Well, here's one that you might not necessarily agree on. You might have your own particular spin. 
what makes you feel, and this question is going to Kate first, uh, what makes you feel you can beat the Republican candidate? <laughs> <laughs> well, he, he's in Mr. the room. Mastriani? Mr. Mastriani's <laughs> in the thoughts? room tonight, so. Um, <laughs> well, um, I certainly, I, I certainly hope that um, either one of us, while um, and it's and it's certainly hard to say because he's right here, but um, <laughs> you know, while while either one of us um, will win right, will win the primary, one of us will win the primary. I certainly hope that we have a Democrat who is going to Hartford in November. Mm -hmm. I think that's the important thing. I think one of the things that we need to remember is that both Chris and I are Democrats. At the end of the day, that's what we are. And it's most important that we come together as a party to put our person up in Hartford. I think for myself, I have the experience, I have the leadership um, to go to Hartford. I've been there. I've I've worked up there. I work up there currently, but I have worked um, for some of the associations that I'm involved in. I, I'm sorry, I'm watching the time and I'm getting like, um, I have worked for some of the associations that I'm involved in. I've already done legislation and I've passed bills up there. So. <laughs> so I believe I can beat the Republican. who's a very nice guy, Mr. Mastriani, how you doing? Um, I believe because my message goes across party lines. I uh, am for the hardworking people of this community through all, through all uh, wh wh whether it's middle class, upper class, lower class, whatever, I think I have a message that will go strong to Hartford and resonate with a lot of people. I think going door to door, people feel like I'm someone that they can relate to, someone they can talk to, and someone that can convey their message when I go up to Hartford. And they, they, I think they also feel like if they call me at 2 in the morning, I'll pick up and say, hey, what can I do for you? And they'll say, and they, and they'll talk to me, and, and I'll be someone that's in touch with them, and and I feel like that's been resonating at the doors I've been knocking on, over a thousand now, and I and I feel like I got a strong message and a strong purpose that just won't let me stop, and I think I can, if I beat Kate Rotella, if if she wins, I'll support her a hundred percent, but if I beat Kate Rotella, I think that message is going to keep going, and I'm going to have a strong, strong momentum going to win in November and keep that seat Democratic. Thank you very much. Um, so I also um, have a proven ability to work across party lines. I've done so for the last three years and would continue to do so. And I think people have seen that um, as I've talked to them out in the district and as they've seen what I've done. Thanks. Very good. But remember, it's got to be a Democrat. Right. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, you're in the right room for that. So that's good. Uh, this question is going to be for Chris. Chris, what committees would you like to be on to accomplish your goals if you make it to Hartford? One would, I'd like to be on education uh, to make sure we get our fair share of ECS funding and to push legislation that doesn't allow the governor to cut our ECS funding when the budgets are already set because that puts a tremendous strain on municipalities. Um, my second one would be public safety because I've uh, been a firefighter for years. I know all the major players around here as far as fire chiefs, fire marshals, EMS, EMS chiefs, EMF, EMS captains. I feel like I can work well together with them to know what they want to go fight for in Hartford. I'd also like to get on commerce so I could stop legislation that hurts entrepreneurs from coming in the area and developing because I believe entrepreneurship is the future of this 43rd district. Thank you. Committees would you like to be on? So um, I would like to be on education so that I can have an impact on um, ECS funding and also some of the other funding issues that go along in education, um, special ed funding. Um, and I would also like to be on the labor committee. Um, I think that I bring a unique perspective to the negotiations of the labor contracts. I've been on both sides of them. I've been on the as the union employee, and I've been on as the manage on the management side. I understand those contracts, and I understand the importance of not reneging on deals and promises that we've given to people. We need to we need to when we're negotiating contracts, we need to effectively remember that people need their retirement. We have to know what to look for, what 
can give and what can't give, right? So um, those, those are some of the committees that I'd like to be on, in addition to probably banking um, would be another one. Um, my finance background would, would help there. Well, I'd love to be on the Appropriations Committee, but I don't think they let freshmen uh, <laughs> they, they don't. go there. They don't. <laughs> That's they where don't. I'd like to be first, yeah. <laughs> but, no. you got to have a little more. Uh, yeah, a, a little time in the game. But, uh, yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, as I said about commerce, I believe, I believe um, that uh, building the economy around here is cru crucial. So I will fight for that, and I will fight to ensure that uh, entrepreneurs get the incentives they need to want to move around here and expand in our uh, 43rd district. First, how can you assist your neighbors, the Eastern Pequot tribe, in reclaiming their federal status recognition? So, um, th that? that's that that so that question um, I would say for me would need would mean that I would need to work with Joe Courtney's office certainly to work on that that type of an item um, that is not something that a state legislator could do on their own um, I certainly could go to meetings with them I could start to encourage those meetings but that is not something that I think that I could bring on my own I would have to work with whoever was in the governor's office um, in addition to really our federal congressmen and senators yeah no I, I yeah, no, I believe that's what it would take uh, because it's, it's, it's not a state issue, it's a federal issue. I'd uh, hear from the Eastern Pequots and uh, call George Courtney's office and, and talk to him and see what we could do to move that forward. I, I plan, if I get elected to state representative and there's federal issues come up, I uh, intend on reaching my hand out and seeing what I can do up there to make a difference uh, for the people in the community. Hey, did you want to add anything else? No. Chris, this has already been alluded to in your community. Would you support a ban on plastic bags and straws? And I'm assuming this would be statewide. Oh yeah, so that's, that, sounds, that, that is a, a town issue. And if that was a, a state issue, um, I just have to see the effect it was gonna have on the businesses. I, I would like to see that eventually. I'd like to see all of that gone eventually because it's more uh, sustainable for us and, it, and, and it's cleaner for us to not have the plastic straws. And I think that's a monumental step forward that uh, Tyler uh, Hayfel, who's a friend of mine, uh, pushed that to get happen in, in the town and uh, the selectmen helped as well. And uh, if that did come to the state, I, I just would have to see how it would affect the local businesses because I wouldn't want to put a strain on them. Maybe we could do it over time, an incremental system that wouldn't put too much of a strain on the businesses, but I would like to see that happen in the future. Okay. Yep. Yes, so um, we on the um, Board of Selectmen just, made, just started a committee to look at this, um, and, I was, uh, and I was in support of it. Um, but again, this is a town, this was at the town level. So at the state level, it's, that's a much different ask, right? Um, we do have to look at the businesses. We have to look at who's using what, what businesses are using the plastic bags, um, and how that would affect our, our manufacturing businesses, our bigger businesses throughout town, um, throughout the state. But I, I think that we have to work with the local towns to pass something like that also. Yeah. Um, I think it's a great um, effort to push forward. And um, I did introduce the Green Star Awards for people, um, which I think is a great way to incentivize people. It is costly. It costs more for the small businesses to have paper products, to have the paper bags, to have the paper containers instead of the plastic containers, mm -hmm. and to have the paper straws. And a lot of people don't like the paper straws. Um, so I think it's an effort that's going to take some time. I really do. I think it's an effort that will take some time. Um, we had a dem we had the um, paper straws that one of our businesses in Stonington was using, and they were they were nice. They were very very nice. Um, I think though that we have to, if we're going to do it from a state perspective, we're going to have to look at how are we going to help communities fund that or businesses fund that. Yeah, absolutely. So, right, the green initiatives, 100%. 
Um, as I said, Rome wasn't built in a day. And this is something I'd like to see in the future. I'd, I'd like to see us have more sustainable, um, healthier environments going on. Absolutely, 100%. Uh, but we're going to have to get to the table with the businesses and the environmentalists and s figure out a strategy to get to that point somewhere down the road. And uh, that would be something I'd be in support of getting everyone to the table, like I said earlier. Thank you. All right, this comes back to schools, which are extremely important for all of us. What ideas do you have regarding adequate school funding for the towns you represent? And we'll begin with Kate. So um, I believe that we have to continue to fight for what we get in school funding. We also have to continue, we have to look at the minimum budget requirement that towns are forced to fulfill. Um, that legislation has been back and forth now for years um, in the House and in the Senate. Um, the minimum budget requirement can be a burdensome to the towns, and I think it's important for us to look at that. Um, we're going to have to, whoever's up there is going to have to fight for the education cost sharing. They're going to need to know, we need to, we need to talk about what it is our community needs and why we need it, our population. What is the growth in our population? We need to reward communities, reward education cost sharing when we have cost savings. What happens with the, with the MBR, the minimum budget requirement, is that we actually aren't rewarded with cost savings. So um, I think that that is a big part of the funding, the education cost share. When I get up there, I'm going to fight to ensure that ECS funding does not get cut. Uh, I feel up there, they, uh, they look at the 43rd district as maybe an affluent district. Um, and uh, there's a big working class contingency around here. And uh, it hurts us tremendously for them to be cutting our education funding and sending it else elsewhere. Uh, oh, sorry. It hurts us tremendously to be cutting our ECS funding and... Uh, sending it elsewhere because it, it, not, it puts a bigger burden on the town which raises uh, the, the taxes for the seniors living here and taxes them out of their homes. So I find it 100% something that I... W is that stop? Are you saying stop? It does say stop. You can finish your sentence. Oh, well, I want to... Just finish your sentence. Yeah, yeah. So um, <clears throat> what I was saying, like, uh, I, I will fight hard to keep that make sure that we get our fair share of ECS funding, the same amount they're getting uh, up there in uh, Fairfield County. Thank you. And Kate, you have another option, uh, opportunity, if you wish. Um, I, again, I would say to you that I will fight for our ECS funding. I have already done that as the select woman for the town of Stonington. I know what it takes to fight for that, and I will continue to fight for that. And. Um, it's also important, I'm going to say, um, that we have stability in ECS funding. We cannot have them pulling funding from us after we've passed a budget. It is, it is so hard on towns. It's stressful. Um, and so I think we need more stability in the ECS funding and what the state will commit to. Thank you, Kate. Uh, the timer informed me that she missed a little bit. So, Chris, if you have anything else you yeah, want to add. Yeah, sure. That's what I was yeah, asking. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. I was like, whoa, right. I'm getting better at talking more. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, so, we're all human here. Oh, absolutely. 100%. 100%. She's great. 60 seconds. We talked before this. So. Yeah. So, um, well, anyway, what I was saying, and to Kate's point, um, we cannot allow the governor to cut our ECS funding after it's already been set in the budget. That is crazy because it puts an undue amount of burden on the selectmen of town. It puts a burden on their funding. They have to draw from their reserve fund, which hurts our bonding rating. We got it. We got it. I, I will fight to stop moves like that if I am elected. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this question is for Kate first, and it has to do with money as well. So. No, Chris first. Mm -hmm. I had. Well, if you agree, is it me first? Yeah. Okay. That's fine. I don't mind. That's fine. Okay. All right. Listen. It's late. It's hot. It's humid. And we don't have microphones. So, it's for Kate, right? You agree? Sure. sure. Yes. Great. All right. It has to do with money. More money. Money. What will you do to ensure adequate funding for our criminal justice system? It's been hurt by a recent hiring freeze. The 
criminal justice system. More funding for our criminal justice system. I think that's very, very, very important. But I think we also have to look at not just funding our criminal justice system, but how are we running our criminal justice system? What are we doing? What is what? How does how does the penal code look in our criminal justice system? What are we? What are the um, offenses that are punishable, and what is the time? How much is it costing us to put people through the criminal justice system? I think that's very, very important. Um, I think that, you know, the I know that the um, prisons, the, in, for the criminal justice system, I guess I'm going to talk about the prisons too. The prisons um, just switched, right, to running their own medical um, stuff. And that was a big, huge thing. They believe that they're going to save money. But again, that's one of those accountability, those accountability funds. We need to watch that. We need to make sure it's doing what it needs to do. So. I think uh, putting in diversionary programs before it reaches the judicial system will help us save money. Also, we talked about the uh, opioid epidemic earlier. I think getting to the root of that problem, you know, focusing on mental health, that will stop a lot of people from getting to the point where they're going to court, they're getting in the system, it's costing more money, it's putting more burden on the taxpayers. If we come together and we help these people with the opioid epidemic and help the first responders um, to uh, do their job adequately, we can take a big, large portion out of the criminal justice system and save more money that way. And like I said, those uh, diversionary programs that stop them go from going to court in the first place whether it be someone that got there with mental health problems that, that created a mis uh, did a misdemeanor or a small crime, maybe we can send them to something else instead of putting them through the system, costing us more money. Katie, do you have anything else to add? Um, again, it, it, I agree. It is about, um, as I said, the social services that we put in place to help people get through our systems. All right. Here we I think this is for Chris first. This is for me. <laughs> and um, the person says, too many industries are leaving the state. How should we reverse the flow? Uh, so a lot of places are leaving the state right now. And I think uh, the way we reverse that flow is um, we, what we do is we work on spending, make sure we're spending in the right place so we're not taxing people out of our state. But first of all, like I said about small businesses earlier, I think incentivizing the small businesses, that brings more jobs. Because small businesses bring more jobs to this district uh, than big businesses. I think we take care of the small businesses through incentivizing them, like I said earlier. Um, that not only gives them incentives to stay and grow their business, but it trains a new workforce because there's plenty of jobs coming. There's jobs over at EB right now. Uh, they, just cut the, they just cut the carpentry program at El Grasso Tech. We need to re-enlist uh, training like that because those jobs are crucial. We need vocational training around here and we need to make sure it, it stays that way because there's a lot of jobs to fill at EB and other various other parts of the state. Okay, um, thank you. So I think for me, um, businesses leaving the state, we need to look at our infrastructure here in the state. We need to look at our roads, right? And so we need to improve some of the infrastructure here in the state. We also need to be more stable in our budget. We need to project a positive, stable environment for people, something that they can count on. We have to invest in local small businesses. They create jobs. I absolutely agree. They create jobs. There are a lot of things that we can do for um, growing our business here in Connecticut. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we just need to build the confidence again that Connecticut's a winning state. I believe this is the best state in the country. I'm sorry if I'm biased or not, but I'm not satisfied with where we're at right now. We're right in between New York and Boston. This is the hub right here. We got such room for growth and I will make that happen if I'm sent up there. Thank you. I'll fight to make that happen, rather. <laughs> I put aside one of these questions because they were actually just addressing it, and it was that is how to bring people, residents, to your community and have a viable community. Mm -hmm. So since you were answering that question already, we're going to put that one aside. This one has a much more national feel. Uh, and it is our last question before closing statements. With Roe versus Wade possibly under attack, 
what is your position on women's rights and the right to choose in Connecticut? Obviously, you have nothing to say about the national, but um, it is uh, Kate. I think it's me. Yep. So um, I believe and support women's reproductive rights. Um, I believe that we that 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 particular um, thing is actually federal. It's not state. Um, in if it did, what can we do in Connecticut to? Should that be under? Attack oh, nationally? if it was under, yeah. If it was under attack nationally, well, we we would have to work together again with our federal legislators, so our federal senators and congressmen, to fight for that, um, to fight for those rights. I also believe that we have a lot of problems facing us, and that we don't need to spend time overturning rights that were already given to people. Chris? So I'd just like to say uh, I'm an Irish Catholic, so I, ha I have those values. That's probably why there's so many of us around. However, <laughs> however, I would never vote to eliminate the women, women's reproductive rights. I owe that to my sister. I owe that to my mother and my aunt and my grandmother sitting there. I, w I would n it's not my place to decide what a woman does with her body. And while we're on that subject, I, uh, on women's rights, I will fight to shatter the glass ceiling. I will, I will fight to instill pay equity in the state because it's ridiculous that women are only making $83, or 83 cents to a man's $1. Yeah. Yeah. $83? Uh, yeah. No, and that's, that's what I have to say about that. If, if that ever came up to a vote for me I, uh, to, to reverse Roe versus Wade, no way. Did you want to say something else on that? Um, I, I would also say, so um, I, I'm, an, I'm an Irish Italian Catholic, so um, that doubles, doubles, yeah, yeah, yeah. doubles for me. But it is not my place, nor do I believe it is our government's place to make that decision. And with that, we're going to end the questioning. Uh, which leaves us just exactly enough time to have the closing statements and the ending of this program on time. And so since uh, Kate was the first to speak, uh, Chris will be the first to do a two-minute closing. So you've all got to know me by now. Um, I just want to say I got a fire burning in my chest. I feel like I want to go up there and fight, and be a full-time legislator. Not just when I'm up there, but coming back to town, talking to the people, calling them up, seeing what they want, getting their opinions, and advocating for them up in Hartford. If elected and given that chance, I will. And you have my word. You can have my home phone number. You can write me. You can email me, no matter what. I love this community. I have a deep connection to the people of this community. And um, I feel like I can be their voice up there. I can be the voice, and I can return the 43rd District to the hardworking people of Stonington and North Stonington. Thank you very much. Um, so I would like to say um, I also agree. I love this state and I love this community. It's very, very important to me. Um, I, I will be this legislator. If I'm lucky enough to be up in Hartford, I will be in Hartford. And you will have my cell phone. You will have my emails. I will be present here um, if you need me. Okay? I, and I will also answer the phone at 2 a.m. if you need to call me at 2 a.m. <laughs> um, I don't sleep much anyway, so that's okay. Um, I think that we need leaders in Hartford with experience in government and the courage to stand up for what is right while still being able to work across party lines. And I believe that I can bring that to our district. Um, I, I, if I'm lucky enough to be a representative, I can hit the ground running. Um, and um, I, I really hope that I will win the election, but if I don't, Chris is um, certainly a great candidate. We need to put a Democrat up there. That's what's important for us. Here, here. But you can count on me to fight for um, our town and our district and for you and to hear what's important to you. With that, I think before we finish our program, there's somebody in the room we should thank for her long service to this district. Diana Urban is retiring. Thank you, Diana.
and vote on August 14th. That is the day of the primary. It's a sleeper because it's August. And most people forget about it. Don't forget about it. Or you don't have any say in the choice. I wish them both a great deal of luck. And thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you, Judy.